The Apostle Paul has just finished telling the Corinthian Christians about the many gifts God's Spirit has bestowed upon the body of Christ. Now he writes, And now I will show you a more excellent way. We read from 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in tongues of human beings and of angels, but I don't have love, I'm a clanging gong or a clashing cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I know all the mysteries and everything else, and if I have such complete faith that I can move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give away everything that I have and hand over my own body to feel good about what I've done, but I don't have love, I receive no benefit whatsoever. Love is patient. Love is kind. It isn't jealous. It doesn't brag. It isn't arrogant. It isn't rude. It doesn't seek its own advantage. It isn't irritable. It doesn't keep a record of complaints. It isn't happy with injustice, but it is happy with the truth. Love puts up with all things, trusts in all things, hopes for all things, endures all things. Love never fails. As for prophecies, they will be brought to an end. As for tongues, they will stop. As for knowledge, it will be brought to an end. We know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, what is partial will be brought to an end. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, reason like a child, think like a child. But now that I have become a man, I've put an end to childish things. Now we see a reflection in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know partially, but then I will know completely in the same way that I haven't been completely known. Now faith, hope, and love remain. These three things, and the greatest of these is love. Here ends the reading. Open our hearts so that we might hear these words and feel your presence in a new way. Amen. Let us bow in prayer. O God, out of all the words which are spoken this day, out of all the words which are sung, out of all the words which are heard, may it be Your living Word that remains with us, that abides with us, that sticks with us, and gives us life. Life with You in the here and the now. Life with You eternally. In the name of Christ, our Savior, and the power of the Spirit, we make our prayer. And let everyone say, Amen. Well, on Friday, right here in this worship space, I had the privilege of leading the celebration of life for Madeline Allen, one of our longtime members. Madeline has been here at Centennial since 1974. That's 45 years And she was 101 years old. It's not often that you get the chance to preach the celebration of life for a 101-year-old. And so to put her 101 years in context, I shared with the congregation gathered here on Friday that Madeline was born during not World War II, but World War I. And that Madeline was born during the presidency of Woodrow Wilson. And so during the course of her life, Madeline was lived during the presidencies of Woodrow Wilson, Warren Harding, Calvin Coolidge, Herbert Hoover, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Dwight D. Eisenhower, John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Baines Johnson, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, then Ronald Reagan, and then George H.W. Bush, and then Bill Clinton, and then George W. Bush, and then uh, Barack Obama, and then Donald Trump. Eighteen presidents in all. A hundred one years. You and I may not make it through a hundred one years or eighteen presidencies. Maybe we will. Maybe we will. But history is not written just by presidents. What's more, God's work in the world is done not just by being famous, but by love. 
So faith, hope, love, abide. These three. But the greatest of these is love, Paul writes in our scripture today. In other words, focus on love. In our scripture from Matthew today, Jesus is put to the test like Pastor Jen was sharing with us. The religious leaders of the day are trying to trap Jesus into making some kind of egregious mistake that they can expose him to the world with as they argue with him. Well, the Sadducees, and the Sadducees were the party of the priestly aristocrats of the day. The Sadducees failed to trap Jesus in their questioning of him. And so the Pharisees step to the fore. And they are the protectors of the 600 plus laws of the Old Testament. And they try to trap Jesus. And so they try to make faith into a head trip. They say, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment of all the 600 plus laws of our Hebrew scriptures? But Jesus refuses to make it simply into a head trip. He focuses on action. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And a second commandment is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these hang all, depend all the law and the prophets. In other words, Jesus focuses them, focuses us on action. Focus on love, he is saying. And in our second scripture today from 1 Corinthians... The Apostle Paul has just been writing about the plethora of spiritual gifts given by the Holy Spirit to the community of Christ's people and has has been going on and on about them. But then instead of always seeking spiritual highs, he says that there's something far more important. He says, and I will show you a still more excellent way a still more excellent way than all those spiritual gifts. And then he launches into his beautiful chapter on love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not arrogant or boastful or rude. Love bears all things, believes all things, endures all things. He says, focus on love. Love, you see, is meant to be a present dynamism in our lives. It is meant to be a now activity. It is meant to be a focus for this moment, and this moment, and this moment, and this moment, as it is woven into our character with the help of God's Spirit. As Christians, love starts and continues and continues with baptism. We are baptized into God's unconditional love. All this is God's gift, we say when we come to baptize a child. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. In other words, we are loved by the awesome creator of the universe from the get-go. We're loved from square one by God. Thursday evening, I got the chance to meet with parents of first time parents and they brought their little nine month old with them to talk about baptism. And I always love the wide eyed wonder of meeting with parents who are yes, they're exhausted, but they're in love with their child. They're in love with their child. And I love meeting with parents who are in love with the wonder of creation, this miracle of creation they're holding in their arms. And I'm always struck by the wonder and sense of responsibility that they feel of raising this little one, this infinite child of God that they are preparing to bring to have the wondrous plentiful waters of God's love sprinkled over him or her. And you know what? 
Baptism isn't just that moment. It isn't just a one-time event. It's something we get to live every day of our lives. It's a journey. It's an expedition, if you will. Sometimes I think journey is way too overused, and, and, and maybe it's almost passive. But, so I like to use the word expedition sometimes. Baptism is an expedition of faith in life. Christ's love isn't just for yesterday, isn't just the baptism in church in front of a number of people or a a high experience that that we had with Jesus. Much as we treasure those, those peak experiences, Christ's love isn't just for yesterday. It's not just to be filed in that mental file drawer called spiritual memories. Christ's love is for today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day and forever. This means that, folks, every day, every day we get to reaffirm that God loves us. Every day we get to recommit ourselves to live out that love of God, loving our neighbor as ourselves. And you're going to figure it out differently than I will. You're going to figure out this out differently than that person will and that person will and that person will but every day in our own unique ways we get to figure out how to share the love of God with the people who come across our paths and God knows that this loving our neighbor isn't just some nice religious phraseology that United Methodists like to say it's not just something we bandy about in the church There's the teenager who needs to know that somebody believes in her. There's the old man who thinks that the world doesn't need him anymore. There's the Muslim woman in a headscarf who gets so many suspicious looks out in public who just needs you and me to greet her, to say a word of kindness to her, to look her in the eyes who just needs you and me to live out Jesus' words, to love our neighbor as ourselves. If you are wondering what your Aikigai is, it's the Japanese word for your life purpose, for what gets you out of bed in the morning, for what makes you tick. If you're wondering what your Aikigai is, start every day with, I am baptized, I am loved. I am called to love people this day. You can't start at a better place than that. It all starts with our baptism. But to share love with your neighbor, it helps to visualize it. The Women's World Cup in soccer is so exciting right now with these world-class athletes from the U.S. and France and Spain and England and so many countries playing on the world stage in Paris and throughout France. And you know, as you think about those soccer players, you know that the goalies are visualizing. They are visualizing making this save and that save. You know that the forwards and the defenders are visualizing making the perfect pass, making the perfect interception. You know that the strikers are visualizing the goalies' moves as they prepare to execute just the right shot on goal. They're visualizing. Likewise, I find that it's helpful to be visualizing love. Acts of love toward others. Seeking the best for our neighbor. Not just wishing thoughts and prayers for somebody, and that's important, but not just wishing thoughts and prayers for somebody, but being the very presence of love for somebody. It's love in work clothes. Love in work clothes. It helps us to visualize love. It was the Special Olympics. 
and the race was just about to begin, and the participants were filled with enthusiasm and energy. And some of them even said that they were going to be the first to cross the finish line. Well, as you could hear the crack of the gun, the the race started off, and the bunch of them were all bunched together for the first several yards until the stronger began to pull ahead slightly. And just then, one of the runners in the middle must have bumped against another runner or maybe simply stumbled and fell to the track. Well, immediately the runners around him stopped to see if they could help. And and he was crying and they they picked him up and dusted him off. And and then the runners who had pulled out in front stopped and looked back and, and they came back to offer whatever they could to help. They finally persuaded the young man to to start running again, to resume the race. And as if on cue, they picked up the pace all together. And the young man was beaming as he raced beside his newfound friends who were also beaming. Visualize it. Visualize that act of love together. Isn't this a picture of the church at our best? Isn't that a picture of what the church is meant to be? To to pick up the wounded, to wipe each other's tears, to be beaming together as we run, as we walk, as we serve, as we pray, as we worship, as we live life together from the heart as we live life together in joy. What was it that the non-Christians of the Roman Empire said about the earliest church? They said, see how they love each other. You know, none of us is perfect. No one's going to make that claim. We are not perfect as the church. We're not perfect as Christians. And maybe that makes love all the more remarkable. You know, it's, it's something that imperfect people do. And sometimes we pick ourselves up and we ask forgiveness and then we go and try to love once again. None of us is perfect. But we get to do this as church. My friends, every moment, every moment, every moment, every day, every week, every year, We get to focus on love and we seek to do so with our children. We seek to do so with our youth. We seek to do so with our adults. We seek to do so with all generations. We seek to do so in the smallest things that we do every week in worship and in Sunday school faith walk. We seek to do so in the big visions in which we have stepped out gutsily in faith in becoming a reconciling congregation, in launching a new campus where we have children who are running up and saying, I want to be baptized. Yeah, we live our mission in love. In love. Michelangelo once said this, and I close with this. He said, the danger for most of us is not that we aim too high and fall short. It's that we aim too low and hit our mark. My friends, in the biggest things and in the tiniest things, our mark is love. May it be so. May it be so.